So the chemistry of sexual activity. Let's look at the chemistry of sexual activity. Sexual activity, in the foreplay stage, we're getting norepinephrine, we're getting increased energy, focus, muscle tension, heart rate's going up, blood pressure's going up, we're getting excitement, our breathing's getting faster, we're getting dopamine surge, we're getting this pleasure, we're having fun. This is exactly what cocaine does to our brain. But not only that, we get endorphins when we're having sex. We get, we get these natural opiates. It creates a euphoria, a high. It dilates the, the blood vessels. We, get, we eliminate pain. We feel good all over, which is exactly what heroin does. And we also get serotonin and GABA increases that cause a great sense of calm, a relaxation, a warm fuzzy all over, which is exactly what marijuana does. Now do you see why sexual addiction is difficult to overcome? So then why doesn't everybody get sexual addiction? Because during sex, in a loving, centered, other-centered relationship, large amounts of oxytocin is released, and oxytocin diminishes the tolerance, neurobiologically in your brain, in the dopamine pathways, in the opioid pathways, and in the GABA circuitry, the, the oxytocin protects those circuits from adaptation that occurs when we use drugs of abuse. So you don't get tolerance, you don't get addiction. But without the oxytocin, then you can have that problem happen. And so sex, as God designed it, involves a physical touch, positive affirmation, trusting relationships, all which increase oxytocin. And then when it all climaxes in this huge dopamine surge, and the combination of both neurotransmitters together result in a powerful bonding experience without addiction. But oxytocin without dopamine, no bonding. And dopamine without oxytocin, no bonding. So, sexual gratification without the high oxytocin increases our risk of sexual addiction. So what if sex with high anxiety, guilt, fear, like pornography, deviant behaviors, premarital sex, what, what's going to happen? What's the risk? Well, the high anxiety, the stress, the fear, raises catecholamine levels. Catecholamine, stress hormones, what do they suppress? Oxytocin. Without oxytocin, having sex increases the risk of sexual addiction. This is why people get addicted to pornography. Or sex with naivety, infatuation, premarital sex, infatuation. Increase oxytocin with subsequent increased in bonding, selective memory, loss of healthy discrimination and judgment. You get this infatuated, overly attached, dependent, needy thing going on and you can't reason and think anymore, and it doesn't matter what the person does, you still have this gooey-eyed thing because your, your oxytocin is like uh, blurring your ability to actually remember anything of substance to make a healthy decision on. So sex and partner selection. Once sexually involved, we have increased dopamine and oxytocin, which the brain rewires. The brain with this combination actually rewires in such a way that the person that you're having sex with, the sensory stimulation from them, hearing their voice, seeing their face, touching them, uh, seeing a picture of them, thinking about them, will cause more release in your reward pathways, your dopamine pathways, than any other person. So they can make you feel good. Just thinking about them, seeing their picture, hearing their voice, you feel good with them like no one else. Your brain rewires because of this oxytocin-dopamine combination. This results in less flexibility in partner selection, which is a good thing if you're married to the person. That's what you want. Okay? That's exactly how God designed it. It's not so good if you're like 16 and hadn't figured out things yet and who you're going to spend your life with. So premarital sex increases the risk of enhanced bonding to a non-spouse, Diminished discernment, discrimination, impaired judgment, selective amnesia, greater trust without evidence, greater emotional attachment. So you lose some of your autonomy and free will and become more bonded in a chemical way to somebody you might not ultimately want to be with. And this is what happens when a lot of people have this sexual activity. They end up marrying people and later down the road as things don't work out and the stress hormones start rising because the constant conflict and fighting, the oxytocin eventually wears off and they really much hate each other. Because they didn't take their time to actually develop a love relationship first. Greater pain at the loss of the relationship uh, if, if we had this premarital sex going on. So you have premarital sex and your relationship ends, it's more painful emotionally 
because these oxytocin bonding thing has to rewire. Greater pain diminishes the oxytocin. So in the next relationship, unless there's time for healing. So if, you, if you've been sexually active and your partner breaks up with you and your relationship ends, you got this fear of pain and you just bounce right into another relationship, you actually have not, the pain that you're still suffering from the first one is diminishing oxytocin release, so it impairs your ability to bond to the next person you're with. So even if you're sexually active with the next person, you don't have the cl- as close a bond as you would have had if you would have waited and allowed your brain to rewire and heal from the first relationship. So this, this results in increased risk of sexual addiction. So benefits of abstinence until marriage. Well, we think more clearly. We make better assessments before we chemically bond and neurologically rewire our brain to someone. Better sex and more intense bonding when you do marry. It's better. Avoid higher levels of emotional pain if the relationship does fail. And avoid the risk of STD, sexually transmitted diseases in pregnancy. Avoid damage to our conscience and the guilt and the fear cascade that we talked about. Decrease risk of sexual addiction. If previously sexually active, if you've been previously sexually active and you're not married, allow time for the neural circuits to reset, i.e. singleness and sexual abstinence before going out and dating and getting involved again. Allow your time to heal. Now these are back now. So that's kind of the overview of, of all the neurobiologic stuff. And now we're going to go into the questions with this as our background and our foundation to be able to pull from to answer the questions. Uh, some of them are just data questions. This is one of them. What percentage of teens have sex?